Hello, everyone, and welcome to the IELTS interview project. This is exciting um, for a couple of reasons. One is that this is episode 10. So we've reached a bit of a milestone. Um, the other reason it's exciting is, of course, the topic and our guest today. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence, specifically chat GPT, from the perspective of what educators can do with it. Um, we might get into a little bit of discussion about is it good, is it bad? It, it, the fact is it's probably here to stay in some form or another. Um, so what do we do about it? Uh, and I'm, I'm excited we have three folks who will talk about their own experiences, putting it to work uh, for educational purposes, and they're in different settings and different levels too. So I think this will have broad appeal. So I'd like to thank uh, Jesse Walker, Jason Kappas, and Frederick Poole for being with us today. And I'm going to ask you all to uh, each to introduce yourself and give a little bit about your background and, and uh, tell us how you became interested just generally in language learning and technology. And then we'll get into artificial intelligence and, and uh, chat GPT specifically after that. So um, why don't we get started with uh, Jason, since you're at the top left of my screen. And you're on mute. All right. So my name is Jason Kappas. I am a software developer. Um, I'm currently creating a language learning video game called Newcomer, uh, which was crowdfunded on Kickstarter in November of 2022. So I became interested in language learning and technology because I ran into uh, some problems in my own language learning journey, which was that um, there were few resources for me to engage in my second language. Um, and I saw many other learners had this problem as well. And I thought that a video game would be great at not only situating, but contextualizing uh, second language learning conversations, uh, which is why I started developing on Newcomer. And uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, ChatGPT today. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Fred? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Frederick Poole. I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University in the Masters of, for uh, Masters of Arts of Foreign Language Teaching online program. And <clears throat> yeah, so I became, I mean, I've always been interested in technology since like day one. I mean, I, I remember being like eight or nine years old, building my own computer. Um, and then, you know, as I went into the university, I uh, fell in love with languages and those two loves sort of naturally came together. Um, but really, my interest in it started coming together as a PhD student when I started looking at, you know, all of these demands that we put on teachers and language teachers in particular in terms of creating their own content and of tailoring the, the materials for the students and assessing their learners. And technology to me just always seemed to be um, sort of a, a solution for addressing the, these massive burdens that we're putting on our teachers. And so I've always been interested in looking at how we can leverage um, technology to improve education in the classroom, but also to uh, <clears throat> more streamline it, so to speak. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, um, uh, Jesse, what, what about you? What's your background and how'd you get interested in AI? I'm sorry. Well, AI, but specifically language learning and technology. We'll get into AI in a second. Yeah, uh, my name is Jesse Walker. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I am a middle school uh, teacher at North Middle School in Colorado Springs. Um, I, um, on my 18th year of teaching, I spent five years teaching in China, teaching English as a second language, and I've done 13 years of teaching Mandarin as a second language. And, um, you know, my, my knowledge of, you know, using technology in the classroom has, has been pretty limited until probably a few years ago when my school asked me to take on um, a load of basically basic uh, computer literacy slash technology for um, an applied academic class due to my Chinese numbers uh, being a little bit in decline. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I started playing around a little bit with coding, uh, since it seemed to be popular and the CTE teacher in the building, um, suggested, you know, maybe going that route. Mm -hmm. And when I was teaching the class, I kind of realized that certain aspects of coding overlapped with, uh, language learning so much that it just sort of got my foot in the door and started getting me to think, um, a little bit broader about, you know, how we could use technology in the classroom to maybe 
get more student engagement. Uh, then COVID hit and with COVID, uh, everybody was just given a computer and a Zoom link if you were lucky and said, do it. And so that really got me into, okay, how can we utilize this um, this set of tools more effectively, especially for language learning, uh, where, you know, with like Mandarin, pronunciation is very important and you got delays and all those other things. So, you know, it's still sort of an ongoing thing. I consider myself very much a novice um, in terms of marrying technology with language learning. Uh, but recently I've been trying to um, kind of piggyback off Dr. Poole saying, um, just trying to help ease my load. Uh, this year I have over 200 students and 12 classes, um, at least three preps. So I'm looking to try to get um, technology and AI to make it more manageable and more reasonable for me. Hmm. Gotcha. That's, that's really interesting. Um Actually, since I already alluded to the next question, if you don't mind, Jesse, we'll stick with you for a second here and just ask. So thinking you know, more focused, not just on a um, language learning technology, but now focusing more on AI and specifically chat GPT, which you all have in common here. Um, what got you interested in it and attracted you to it as a possible learning solution or a tool that you could leverage to create learning solutions? Yeah. Um, so like I said, working with my CTE um, coworker in the building, he shot us an email. I want to say December of this year um, said, hey, this thing, this is pretty cool. Check this out. Um, I've been playing with it and it seems really powerful it was basically the only email we got. And so naturally, curiosity just started playing with it. Um, me and my coworker who teaches Spanish in the building, we started seeing, well, could it do second languages? We were very quickly pleasantly surprised at how much more accurate the language was compared to something like Google Translate. Um, and so immediately me and my coworkers in the applied academics department, we started looking at what we had been doing since COVID. Um, in our building, we have gone into like an integrated um, technological model where most of the common core teachers are using um, some online platform to present information and students are reading their text online and answering their study guides online. And so then we're like, well, what happens when we take these questions from that and put it in the chat? Can it answer it? We're just getting answers right away. And so very quickly, we started having these conversations like, okay, what do we do as educators? Um, this machine seems to be able to, to get all these answers um, from these sort of modified homework or worksheet assignments. So what is our role as a teacher? Do we just take computers away or can we leverage it as a tool? Do we rethink everything, go back to paper and pencil? Um, and so these are sort of the starting questions that we had in our building to use it. And um, we just kind of decided we should just continue using it to see what it does. So we're familiar with it in case um, students start using it more um, and try to get in front of it and be more proactive instead of reactive with it. And luckily, our district has been supportive of that and has um, officially um said that it is open for both teachers and students to use in uh, as opposed to different school districts in the region who have shut it down or blocked it uh, for either students or teachers. So, um, you know, currently I, um, you know, is the novelty of it that got me into it. And, you know, right now I am um, using it to create, try to create supplementary activities for different curriculum um, that I have already written, um, trying to create some depth to things that already exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so a little bit of learning design, perhaps, and support that way. Um, Fred, what would you say to that? Uh, what 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 about ChatGPT in particular attracted you to it, or exploring it at least? Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, similarities there. I think you know when we think about like chatbots typically in like the LLT or the call field, computer assisted language learning. Um, we have a long history of these sort of very simplistic uh, 
you know, software that can give you these short back and forth conversations. And that has kind of limited our scope and what we think of chatbots, what their uses are, what they're good for, and how we might bring them into the classroom. And a lot of the times it's just sort of mimicking the dialogues that we have in the classroom. But when I first, when you first get into ChatGPT, and then all of a sudden you realize that, oh my gosh, it can create an essay. And then it can create this essay within, you know, from the voice of, you know, some famous artist, you know, and all of a sudden you're starting to realize that uh, this thing is, I mean, we're still exploring what its capabilities are and what it can produce. And so it was that, I guess it was that aspect that that sort of mind blowing aspect of like, wow, it's not just conversations. It is lesson planning. It is material designing. It is programming. <laughs> it is so many things. And I think just that, uh, <clears throat> That scale of it is what I think it gets a lot of people excited in wanting to explore what it can do. And that's really where we're all sort of like sort of gravitating for it. Cause you start to realize very quickly that this is different from some from the other tools that we've had and that we need to start investing time in this, as Jesse was saying earlier, we need to um, explore what its uses are. And we, we still don't even know what, what are the limitations and how do we leverage this properly in terms of like what our prompts look like. And that's something that I'll talk a little bit about here in a little bit about how just simple prompting can make all the difference um, in what what sort of results that you get. But I mean, I think the final thing I'll say on this is that it just goes back to what I was saying earlier about technology is that when we start thinking about our language classroom and wanting to create all of these materials that are different, you know, that are at different levels, proficiency levels for our students, but also that are addressing their individual interests, uh, but then also giving them support to go through these. I mean, these are things that we can start to do very, very quickly with ChatGPT. And that becomes a very powerful tool for a language teacher. Good, great. Um, I think there's a whole lot to unpack as we we talk. Right. Uh, this afternoon. <laughs> um, let me get Jason in here. Now, Jason, um, you're more of a you know, you're a language learner, but also um your your focus is on software development. So what got you interested in AI and you're also using ChatGPT specifically? What attracted you to that as a possible solution to what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, um, I guess in general, I mean, I was immediately attracted to ChatGPT because it's just like this superpower. Um, I mean, it can code, it can write, it can reason, it can talk about languages. Um, so, but specifically more for software development. I was kind of playing around with it, um, using it um, to create a web-based chatbot. So basically having ChatGPT act as like a, a barista. But I saw that other, you know, other software developers kind of beat me to the punch and uh, like lingostar.ai, Quasal, great applications. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's what's really great about ChatGPT is a super I mean, from my perspective as a programmer, I think it's it's quite easy to to implement it and have it do pretty incredible things, kind of right out of the box. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember like the month after this tool came out, like I felt like I was stuck in a conversation loop because all I was doing was like talking about this tool. <laughs> I don't know if you guys were like the same way, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I would say ChatGPT is probably the most spectacular innovation that I've ever used in my life, followed maybe by, I don't know, Facebook and and the iPhone. I know I'm kind of kind of dating myself. Anything past 1997 is, I, I have no recollection of, but uh, yeah, I mean, so yeah, ChatGPT, incredible um, software development tool, incredible learning solution. I mean, this thing can um, write, like it has written, written code for me that would have taken like in five seconds, that would have taken me like four to eight hours to write. I mean, it's just like, it's it's mind blowing. Um, of course, you, you know, you you have to bet the results and hallucination is a problem, which I'm sure that we'll, we'll get into later in the podcast. Good, yeah, I, yeah. We'll certainly want to talk about vetting it and, and what you have to do, what your responsibility is. It's certainly, I think in the background, perhaps for a number of folks is the fear that we'll all be replaced by it. Uh, right. That really realistic. Um, so we'll, we'll get into all that. But what I'm one of the things I want our viewers to know is I'm very excited about this. 
uh, as we're kind of in the middle of our time here, is we're going to take a few moments and ask each of our guests to demonstrate a little about what they're working on. And each has agreed to take over the screen and do a little bit of sharing. So let's start with Jesse. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about what you're working on, some of the projects, and, and how you're using it? Still muted. No, I'm unmuted. Um, yeah. Um, so I thought I would um, maybe start with something that was successful um, and then sort of show what I'm playing with now. Because again, like I said uh, before, um, I am, I, I, I keep trying to like push it almost to the point of breaking it. And I would, uh, I can't find my PowerPoint. Um, so, um, so starting with, and let me know, it looks like you can see it. I got a lot of screens here. Let me, so this right here that you are looking at, this is a very simple uh, post reading um, sort of three uh, similar stories that have different information uh, based on real people, real students that I'm teaching. Um, the, the context is we're talking about hobbies and sports. Um, I created a simple story based on the comprehensible input model, um, around a student being good at basketball and, you know, LeBron James being the famous person inside of it. Um, but there are, there were students of mine that liked playing soccer, couldn't care less about basketball, um, like playing volleyball. And um, what was the other? One? And then I did a, a a different basketball story with a boy, and it, so I plugged in the story and said, "Hey, can you change these facts?" And it generated these three stories um, on its own, and um, I was able to create this sort of uh, worksheet, so to speak, uh, where I could give my students a cold reading that. Um, that sort of enriches what we've already done and forces them to uh, work with the material on their own a little bit more to try to uh, push their level of the topic um, further, which I found was was great because, you know, as a teacher, we are introduced to this idea of taking uh, personal interests and creating unique information for your students. And I've just never had the time to do that um, with the amount of students that I've had. And so while I was teaching, I was kind of like, hey, uh, chat, can you do this for me? Um, it, it pumped it out. I had to edit it slightly and I was able to create a worksheet within a 30, 30 minute plan that had three separate um, uh, content. Um, you know, part of what I'm trying to do here in, um, in my curriculum overall is follow the actual standards and try to get more nonfiction, uh, worked into the curriculum. So with the same, um, sort of, uh, unit, um, I wanted students, students didn't realize that the China has a professional bas basketball association. Um, so using, um, information I got from ChatGPT, um, simple images. I created this PowerPoint so that I could teach them a little bit about um, China's uh, professional basketball league. Uh, this actually taught me something very valuable about ChatGPT, which is it acts very well. Um, it, it acts like it's giving you facts but you have to really double check the fact um facts that it gives you um you know is it it just gave me some wild information that is not actually true so um i i learned had to go back double check um did another similar thing with my students uh, in sixth grade you know they're learning the very basics of chinese um and you know how to how to ask and answer do you speak chinese and like hey where could you speak chinese if you want to speak Chinese, got a lot of information from chat GPT um, and put together a simple PowerPoint where we could talk about um, locations, populations, um, and percentage of populations that speak Chinese, um, aiming for that nonfiction um, aspect into my curriculum. 
Um, so that's been pretty, pretty good. Now, recently, again, I'm trying to see what it can and cannot do. Um, and I need this to be bigger. Sorry. Um, and so recently, again, trying to take things that I have written and telling chat GPT, like, okay, so take the above story and create a gap fill exercise for a novice level Mandarin class, just sort of seeing what it can do. Um, you know, produces a couple blanks and then nothing really more. So learning as I'm doing, you know, what sort of um, prompts I need to give it so it can create better stuff. What's interesting is if you're not, um, if you're not clear, uh, you don't quite get what you want. But this one is kind of where what I was really looking for is something that the students could quickly read. And then, um, you know, it gives me uh, sort of a Quizlet format or whatever. Um, so this was really good. It took a while to get there. Uh, and then the final thing I've been trying to play with, uh, you know, in terms of Mandarin, you have to learn characters and the phonetic script. And one of the ways I like to do that is to um, have the students identify different phone memes and morphemes in the story, write it down in partner reading. And so I was like, you know, it would be really great if Chat GPT could just do that for me. And so when I asked it, um, using the original story to identify phonemes that uh, and characters examples, um, it it didn't do this well at all. Um, you know the. Uh, a sound is, or the uh sound here is not chu and nali and naga and b. So these are just completely wrong. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, trying to play with my wording to see if it can do that. Um, and so far, I have not found um, the right way to interact with chat, GT, chat to get this um outcome and I'm, I'm thinking that it could i just don't quite know how to get it there um and then the last thing oh it's not gonna load it for me of course <laughs> it's gonna crash uh let me stop the share um there <clears throat> there was another thing that i was having to do similar idea um taking a story that i'd written something simple around birthdays um uh, and giving it to chat, like, hey, this is the information. Um, can you give me X, Y, Z? And so I, I was thinking, I was like, what are some cultural differences between um, Americans and Chinese in celebrating their birthdays? And it gave me a list. It missed that Chinese people really celebrate 12 year old birthdays, but you know, they, it was mostly accurate. I was trying to use information that I already knew. So I didn't have to like go and fact check uh, chat. And then when I was like, okay, take the above information, the cultural um, information you just gave me and create a story based on three different stories based on that information. And what's really interesting is that it blended the two cultures. So it just told me that in America, the age of 18 is an important birthday because Americans are considered adults. Um, and in China, they don't do that. They, they look at more longevity milestones like 60, 70, 80. And so then when it created a story in Mandarin, it had um, some American, uh, let's just say Alice or whatever, um, celebrating her 18th birthday in China. And that's very important in Chinese culture, which it just told me is not actually what was important. So um, very interesting how sometimes um, depending on how you interact with it, it, it sort of divert slightly um and it's sort of as a second language teacher um it 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 can get out of the target language for me that would be mandarin and get into english and giving me english outputs and i have to remind it like no uh, i need this in mandarin um but you know so far it's been um it's been a real time saver for creating these ideas because uh, just idea generation in general, like, hey, I have this story. Um, could you generate five different exercises I could use as a teacher to enrich this um, this story and this activity? And it it generally gives me, um, you know, some some real basic teaching stuff. Um, but it's nice as a teacher who's been doing this for a while. Sometimes you forget about um, 
you get into your rut and you forget about the other ways to do it. So it's, it's been fun. Um, IG, idea generating and just building that um, extra depth and stuff. It's very interesting. I'm, you know, I was thinking as we were talking, you know, I've heard anecdotally and I don't know from personal experience, but that it's better in English and um, clunkier in other languages uh, you know, accuracy and and those kinds of things that you're talking about, uh, mixing cultures and, you know, something that's factual somewhere is not universally factual, for example. Um, so, you know, kind of underscores that. Uh, in any event, let, let's move on to Fred. Um, so what are you working on? And um, what would you like to demonstrate for us today? Yeah, so I've been, this, let me pull this up real quick here. I've been working with um, using ChatGPT in a uh, Google Forms or yeah, Google Spreadsheets, Google Sheets, I guess. Um, and you, there's a number of templates out there that you can you can go into uh, ChatGPT, sign up for an API, and then you can add it on as an extension, GPT for Sheets, set your API key. And then what this allows you to do then is it allows you to write a simple um, Excel code or Google Sheet code. So e this cell is gonna equal GPT, and then it's going to go to my cell one for my prompt. And then it's going to go to A3, which is my writing, what my student's writing prompt is. And then there's a few other metrics you put in, and then it's going to output a score. So what I'm really trying to do here is I'm trying to automate um, applying a rubric to a writing process to see how well it does at scoring, um, <clears throat> how well it does at scoring these writing prompts. Now, in this run right here, I'm not actually showing the writing prompt. It's in column A, which I'm hiding uh, for various reasons. Uh, but what I'm essentially trying to do is up here at the top, I have four different prompts. <clears throat> and I'm using these prompts to assess this writing, uh, this writing excerpt on a scale, on an actual scale from one to nine, where one would be like a novice low, and then a nine would be an advanced high. Now, the score over here is the score that this writing prompt actually got. And you can see how each one of my prompts, which are varying in levels of specificity, um, are doing in terms of how close it is. So this first one, it was scored as a four, ChatGPT, the, the first prompt gave it a six, second one's a seven and a seven, they're both pretty good. And then a six and a seven, still pretty good. And then a four and a four and a six and a seven. So this first prompt that I'm using um, actually performed quite well. And I'll eventually, um, the nice thing about this is I can take this code and drag it down and I can automatically score two or 300 um, essays and compare each one of these style of prompts that I have to see which one is going to be performing um, better over time. So this is something I've been working on trying to figure out what types of prompt are, are going to be uh, uh, closer to how a professional raters are doing. And what I've found, and again, I'm not gonna go into the prompts yet, uh, but I will say that you need to be very explicit with ChatGPT. The, the more explicit you are in terms of what a novice low looks like. A novice low has at least five errors in this prompt. An uh, uh, advanced high has zero errors, right? And so you need to give it hard numbers and really sort of uh, make it concrete what you're looking for at each one of your proficiency levels. Whereas if you use some of the um, can-do statements that we are that we might be more familiar with, these tend to be a bit more vague and ChatGPT really struggles at getting a more uh, consistent and regular score going forward. But in addition to sort of working with these different prompts and working with these rubrics, what I'm also looking at is are some more practical things that teachers might do. So like right here, I have ChatGPT where I say, tell me three things that this writing prompt did well. And one thing you'll notice that we had talked a little bit about before this, um, I'm using GPT 3.5 model for this one. Uh, and this is just a, a warning to users out there who want to play with these Excel sheets as well. Um, in this one, I'm using GPT 4, which is much better, but it's costly. If you're going to be tapping into the API to play around with this stuff, you will have to pay for it. Uh, GPT 3.5, I can um, run this prompt and get three um, three suggested uh, things that uh, this writer did well for over 200 students for about 25, 30 cents. It's pretty cheap, but the GPT 4 gets exponentially uh, more expensive. So what I've been doing with these ones is, you know, tell me three things that the prompt did well, three things that it could do to improve it. Um, <clears throat> but the other thing I wanted to show you is, and this is going back to what Jesse was talking about in terms of wanting to create individualized material for um, students. 
uh, what's pretty cool is that if once once you have this in Excel, you could very quickly make a list of your students. So, you know, John, Mary, Patty, Maribel, Jackson, you can go through for each of them, write two or three items about their interests. What are they interested in? What is their A? What are their future goals? What is their proficiency level? And then over here, I can write a simple prompt that says, take into account all of these items and write up a, you know, write up a, a, a 50, a 50 word, you know, uh, text that I can use in class. And then it's just a matter of dragging it down. And now all of my students have an individualized text that I can constantly be updating depending on their interests, their proficiency levels, or the vocabulary that we were working on if I wanted to add another column of key vocabulary words. And so you can see very quickly how we can um, not only make three uh, texts for our students, but every student could have their own text. And then once we are in the classroom and every student has their own text, this opens up what we can do for speaking activities because we have now a reason to have students compare what text they got, what happened in your story, right? And you know, now we have these meaningful reasons to start exchanging language with each other in the classroom rather than everyone reading the exact same text, right? And so this right here, you know, like the, the potential for this goes much further. So this is where I've been lately is I, I've been really interested in Google Sheets largely because it's a tool that most teachers are familiar with. It's a way for them to really tap into the power of um, <clears throat> ChatGPT without having to um, know hardcore coding skills. Um, and it can, you know, it can make a, a large impact on what they're doing on their day-to-day -day practice. So that's what I have to share. Great, thank you. This is gonna be exciting uh, debriefing. Um, so Jason, let, let's uh, ask you to demonstrate what you've been working on and then we'll get into some questions about just generally speaking, where it's going and and uh, affordances, things to be worried about and concerned about, and so forth. Okay, sure Jason. thing. Okay, so I am working on newcomer. It's a it's a cross platform language learning video game that will be available on iOS, Android, including Chromebooks and Steam. So while many apps are focused on teaching vocab and grammar, uh, newcomer focuses on um, meaningful content and, and communication. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I plan to make this available uh, to regular language learners and uh, foreign language classrooms. So right now I'm going to show a basic uh, conversation that a user would encounter uh, while playing newcomer. So I'm going to share my, my screen. Okay, can we, can we see it? Yes. Okay. Bonjour. Bonjour. Comment allez-vous? Comment allez-vous? Depuis l'arrivée du match virgule, mon opération minière s'est arrêtée. Mon opération minière. OK, so uh, I'll take a bit of time to explain just, like what just happened there. Um, so what you just saw was a, a French conversation. Uh, so, um, so I guess generally in Newcomer, you can translate all of the target language dialogue that, that you come across. And you can build multi-word uh, questions or statements to say to the NPC, and the NPC can understand what you're saying and, and respond appropriately. Um, in addition, you have this phrase book that shows uh, the current phrases that you can use in conversation. So, you know, if you want to say something in conversation, you notice this kind of gap in your linguistic system, you can bring up your phrase book and find out what, what phrase you, you want to communicate. Um, and there's also this, this grammar tab that gives a grammatical breakdown for every word in the sentence. And that is actually powered by, by chat GPT. Um, and, uh, so I guess in general, if you're a user of, of newcomer, you'll pick your native language and the target language you want to learn. So the currently supported languages at first will be English, Spanish, French, and Italian. So an English speaker could learn French and a Spanish speaker 
could use a newcomer to learn English. Um, and, you know, in, in the future, I'll be adding uh, GPT powered characters that you can, you can speak with. So that's something I'm, I'm super excited about. I mean, just imagine going up to someone, just, just speaking to this character inside the world, you can edit what you say, and then they'll be able to understand anything that you say and respond in, in character. Um, so that's something I'm super, super excited about. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm, what I'm making. So, so the corpus that it's relying upon then would essentially be infinite in that the, the chat GPT will continue to learn and will be able to generate more and more as it interacts with users. Is, is that, that the gist? Yeah. Well, the, when the characters are GPT powered, I mean, yeah, they'll be able to, to, they'll be able to respond to anything, but in terms of them, the characters remembering what they're saying about themselves and referencing that information later, that will be more of a challenge for sure. But it, it just at first is going to be pretty, it's going to be pretty, pretty minimum. But what is actually really interesting is that you can have these, you know, you can tell ChatGPT role play as a right. medieval hunter from this village, you know, nothing about technology, nothing about sports, nothing about politics. And it won't, it won't talk about these topics and it, and it will like talk about like what it, what it hunted. And, and actually Fred played a, an early version of that where he was speaking Spanish with this hunter and they were talking about, I don't remember exactly. They were talking about what the hunter was hunting and the hunter offered to give Fred a recipe on how to make this, this like meat dish. Um, so that was, so I guess what's, you know, it's just super exciting. Like just there's, you don't know, it's not scripted and it, and it responds to what you, you can say, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself because this isn't, this is, you know, of course, in very early prototype. And, um, you know, there are already web-based chatbots that can do this, right? Uh, but I guess within Newcomer, it will kind of be um, integrated into this this world. So um, I want to jump in off this too yeah, for a second because sure. I was... Um... I've actually been putting together sort of like the, the bare bones prototype for like a, I do a lot of murder mystery um, games in my classroom. And so I have this sort of chat bot where there are four chat bots um, that are powered by GPT in the background. And like Jason was saying, each one of them, I've given them a role where I've said, okay, you're the murderer, but you are a rich, wealthy person who um, is very, you know, friendly with most people. And, you know, I, I give them all of the, the background information of how they're going to interact. Then another person, you're not the murderer, but you don't want to share your past because you've had a very shady dealings with some local mafia and you don't want to bring this up. And so you can put into each one of these background stories and just have people chat with them to try to figure out how all of these people are interconnected with each other. But thinking about this from, you know, like a video game like Jason's got going here, very quickly, you have the potential for, you know, NPCs that have, you know, you know, infinite background stories that you can start creating and having conversations with you as you're playing. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, Jason, please, I don't want to cut you off. Oh, well, I was just going to say that um, I, was, I was pretty much finished, but I forgot to mention that, uh, you know, it's not like these are just meaningless conversations. They're actually guided with tasks. So there are goals that you need to communicate, um, at least right now through this sentence building mechanic that was shown in, in the video. So um, the game is actually quite, quite structured. It's not just super open. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And that, that's, um, that's very important. I think for, for those folks watching us here is, is to know that there are learning outcomes. There is structure. There are actual standards. You all have mentioned those. We mentioned can do statements. This is very much grounded in, in practice, all of this. Um, I wanted to broaden now that we've looked at specifically what you're working on and get at some of those, you know, in the time that we have left here, some of those bigger questions about AI and chat GPT. There's a lot of fear, a lot of speculation out there. I, I saw something on the news about um, someone wants to um, put in legislation that the nuclear codes will never be given to chat GPT. Uh, and I, it was a serious article. It wasn't, you know, one of these joke ones that, you know, the onion or something. Um, so, but just broader a little bit, what do you all see as the the benefits, the affordances we talk about in, in call? Um, 
you know, what's out there that is positive? What can it do that other solutions can't do? And then we'll get into the challenges. And I'll just open this up to sort of a free for all rather than calling on you in, in any particular order. So anyone who'd like to speak first, please unmute and go for it. Yeah, so are we talking about the affordances? Mm -hmm. uh, affordances first, okay. benefits. Yep. Yeah, well, I, I think generally what ChatGPT is doing is that it's democratizing private tutoring for everyone around the world. And I think that's super powerful. And before ChatGPT, there was a financial barrier. If you wanted to have someone who was an expert on this subject, you had to pay for them. Now that's 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 no longer the case. All you need is, is you know, the ability to uh, search a URL and, and you can use this, this chatbot. So I think, you know, for students, uh, this could be a really powerful tool to more quickly learn rote information and, and, and concepts such that they can, you know, spend more time on critical thinking, creativity, actually communicating with their second language, um, applying that knowledge to solve real, real world, real world problems. Um, so, yeah, and uh, I think there, there's probably uh, granted I'm I'm not an educator, but but I imagine that you know you can you can sanity test ChatGPT on whatever content that you're teaching that week to see okay how well can this thing actually just like discuss what I'm teaching like I would imagine that that could be one path to test whether or not it you know would work for your your, your context. Yeah, right. yeah, I actually saw in a podcast um, about that very topic there. During the pandemic, there was this company that was doing a subscription based model and it was taking um, basically university standardized curriculum for the you know undergraduate level and offering study um, material for them. And, you know, some people, the criticism of it, it was, you know, paid to get you know, cheating materials or whatever. And since chat GPT is raised in popularity, the the stock price of that has dropped tens of millions of dollars because people are, are like, well, wait, why am I paying for that when I could just use chat GPT? Um, but in terms of that, I, I feel like I, I, I hope that this sort of gets us out of that standardized curriculum where you know across the board all the schools have the same textbook we're doing the same thing we're getting the same answers and get back to you know like one of the things that i loved as as an undergrad was that socratic seminar and really bouncing ideas off of each other interacting with each other um you know going from a reading generate using the reading to generate ideas challenge your own belief structures and i think with chat gpt that can be a very useful tool to bring in um you know to some of these things um different conversations not only in core content but you know like we keep talking about world language there's so many possibilities to to get chat into the classroom so that we're talking with it um, or using it as a tool to broaden vocabulary in a um a reasonable way for uh the classroom teacher to manage yeah. And so I guess my my take on it is that I, I think that the initial the initial sort of intuitive take on chat GPT when people will first see this is that it is sort of the ultimate one-on-one -on -one tutor. And then like I think Jason was kind of alluding to there, I think in some ways it can be. Uh, but when I when I'm talking to language teachers, what I want to emphasize is that you know, like one of the reasons that we, we have students in classrooms because we want that human to human interaction. And so for me, like what ChatGPT gives us or how we can leverage it is it allows us to have much richer inter interactions in the classroom by creating um, these materials for some la for languages that don't often have resources. I mean, if you're working as a world language teacher in the US and you're not working with the Spanish or French curriculum, uh, you know, the amount of resources you have drops off pretty quickly. Right. Or I, mean, I, I can't tell you how many times that I've been in the classroom and I've been like, oh, man, I have this great idea for this like activity in which my students are going to be in a Dungeons and Dragons campaign. But then I start thinking about uh, all of the material I'm going to have to create for each of the background stories for all of my characters. And all of a sudden, I'm like, eh, I'll just, I'll just go back and do this other thing. Um, and this is where sort of chat GPT for me really shines is that it can, you know, it, it's going to a lot. Like if you look at it in terms of like, 
creating nonfiction things, then, uh, you know, that gets pretty exciting because you're not so much, you're not so worried about the, uh, the veracity of it. Um, and it allows you to, it really kind of opens up what you're able to do and what types of activities you're willing to engage in in the classroom. And uh, that to me is where we should be kind of focusing our efforts now. Now, and my one caveat to this is that we have to realize is that this thing is going to continue to evolve and develop. Like this is, you know, I think we've all heard it a hundred times that like this is the worst it's ever going to be. Um, and another year from now, you know, I may be walking back everything that I'm saying about the individualized tutoring. It may get to that point where it just is that good. Um, but I, I think that we we, we do want to maintain that I mean, the reason we're learning languages communicate with others. We want to be able to use it. We want to be, we want community. We want to be able to socialize. And this can be something that helps mediate that interaction by giving us prompts and inspiration and ideas. Um, so in the interest of time, um, let's get to the CV, sort of seamy side of it and the uh, the caveats and, and concerns. Um, you know, what what might you have? For example, I'll throw out there, does the, the, the ability that this has to create almost endless amounts of activities and stories and interactions, does that mean that it also is a, a bigger burden on your time because you need to vet everything? You know, is it is it we're giving the right cultural information in the right context? Of, so is it, um, right. does it take more time than it saves, for example, depending on how you use it? Well, I'll just, I'll double up and jump in on this real quick then. I, I think there's a few big points I'd put out there. Um, <clears throat> number one, uh, my, my, my big, uh, I, I think this is going to challenge what we as world language teachers think of as authentic material. In some ways, we, when we first see this, we were thinking, oh, this is an authentic text, right? And it feels authentic. I think linguistically, it probably is approximates authentic, authentic text for a lot of languages that we're working in, but culturally it's missing it, <laughs> right? It's going to be very biased towards, uh, ChatGPT's own developers will tell you this themselves. It's very biased towards Western, um, <clears throat> Western writers and Western ideologies and narratives. And so we have to have that in the back of our mind that this is not necessarily representing the culture that we are teaching, even though it looks like that. And so that's a cautionary tale is, if you're using this, again, if you're using this for factual information, if you're using this as a cultural teacher, you need to take a step back and question why and how you're using it. If this is something that you're using as an adapted text, that as sort of a graded reader to bring your students up to an authentic text very quickly, I think you're using it in the right direction in the right ways at the at this point in time. The other, the other risk or cautionary tale that I'll have in the sake of time is less of a risk or cautionary tale, but more of a suggestion. And I think that there's a tendency for educators and people who are using this on it to see ChatGPT as this sort of finalized product. And it's not, it, it's very much something that is going to develop, it, it's developing, it's going to be evolving, but it's also very much dependent on, again, I can't emphasize this enough, but the types of prompts that you're adding to ChatGPT. Too many times I, I hear people say, well, ChatGPT can't do this. And I go, well, it might be able to do that. You're just not prompting it in the correct way, right? Because there's a lot of what we can provide examples to chat to be key and say, hey, here are three examples of things I want to be able to create. Now I want you to recreate that, right? And so th th there's a number of strategies that we can do in terms of prompting, and that is going to constantly increase and improve the sort of results that we get. And so I, I, I just sort of urge teachers to think of chat to be key in that way, rather than this finished software that is sort of you know finite in what it can produce yeah and just kind of piggybacking off of that um you know in, in order to get the right outcome for this tool it takes quite a bit of prompt engineering so um i think people using the tool should be familiar with um the terms one shot learning and few shot learning so fred correct me if i'm wrong but one shot learning is where you provide an example of like what the output would be um or, and then few shot learning is where you provide multiple examples. So now the, the chat bot understands like how the outcome needs to be formatted, for example. So um, that has been very effective uh, for me, but just getting to kind of the, the risks. The I mean, the most obvious one for me is that ChatGPT hallucinates and, you know, that just kind of calls into question everything. So you gotta really look over what it outputs. And I think when it comes to translations, 
I think that for higher resource languages like Spanish, French, and English, I actually think it's it's quite good. Um, but I think for like the lower resource, the lesser resources the language has, like the worse it gets. Um, I mean, I've I've seen a lot of examples of of this tool just like completely making up grammar rules for lesser resource languages. So that's certainly something to look out for. I would guess yeah. it'll learn on eventually, you know, as, as it's gotten more inputs, it will learn more. Yeah, sorry, Jesse. Oh, that's okay. Um, yeah, I was just gonna piggyback with the more researched um, or the more resourced languages out there, like especially Spanish and French. There's a number of teachers that have over the years created uh, resources and tried to sell them. Like um, uh, I'm thinking like the novel based um, comprehensible input. And I've talked to some of these authors and there are people out there that are taking their book and putting it in the chat GPT and being like, hey, you know, can you change a number of these things? And they feel like this is, you know, stealing their work, plagiarizing them. And, um, you know, so that I think is going to always be sort of in the background as it sort of draws on everything that's out there. Is it plagiarizing per se from everybody? Where is that line? Like, is that taking me personally? I feel like as a professional, if you're taking somebody's work, putting into chat and be like, take this and change four things that feels like you crossing the line. Um, but one more uh, practicality, you know, from somebody who's in the K through 12 environment, um, we seem to forget that teachers every three to five years are sort of asked to rewrite their curriculum for whatever reason. And one of the things that it does really quickly and effectively is give me a first draft that I can sort of present to my administrators like, hey, I got a new curriculum for you. Um, and it saves me time if I don't have to rewrite everything that I've already written three or four times to actually spend time bringing materials and using chat uh like dr Poole said as you know as a first draft you know play with it get some ideas generated and then use my professional judgment and my expertise and the content to uh sort of steer the ship and you know give actually give my students more time that my school district and i'm sure other k-12 through teachers will say that their school district seems to take from them for writing and rewriting things that may or may not be applicable to what they're doing at the time so um so one last thing just as we as we segue out and and uh, move toward the end of, of our time today um, you know, where does the future hold? And, and I'm thinking of things like, for example, does this create a new role perhaps for learning designers or curriculum specialists? Does this create a new wor world in libraries and academic support uh, in institutions for folks who specialize on using these kinds of tools, artificial intelligence more broadly in things like ChatGPT specifically? And, the, and you have the AI person in, in your department, uh, for example. Um, so that kinds of thing, what do you see as potential futures uh, as we, we look at this now at the uh, at the crossroads, so to speak? I see, I see two things. One, I think like this is, it, it won't be long until we have, you know, an AI class or a CS class. I, I think that that'll be part of your curriculum. It's, it'll be important for students to learn how to interact with it. But I think probably something that we're gonna see maybe a little quicker than that is just sort of a, a negotiation or a change in many of the constructs that we sort of value in the world language classroom. For the most obvious example is writing. What does it mean um, to write and how do we evaluate writing? Um, and we've seen this over, over time with technology in general. Um, when we stopped writing on paper, then you know your penmanship be, was no longer a part of the construct of writing. Like we, we were no longer looking at that and using that as means to assess our learners. And then the more that we're getting into typing and we're having Microsoft Word, you know, punctuation starts to disappear a little bit too because these things get automated. Um, and that's gonna it's gonna happen with uh, GPT as well. And I think what it's gonna mean is that we're gonna have, start evaluating writing on ideas and idea generation rather than on the quality of writing, so to speak, right? And so we're, we're going to start to see change and that's going to be a very tense process. It's going to evolve what it is that we value and what that looks like. There's going to be pushback, but that's going to be a conversation that has to has to happen. Yeah, I guess um, thinking about this in terms of like language learning applications, I think 
we're already kind of seeing where it's heading. We've seen a lot of these really incredible web-based chatbots. And I think that these are only going to keep getting better um, over the next couple of years. And I think we'll soon start to be seeing like GPT um, power characters that you can speak with inside of virtual worlds. Um, and, you know, that's something that I'm working on. And I'm sure that there will be other people working on that um, in the space as well. Um, and I think as time progresses, hallucination will be probably less of a problem. I know for GPT-4, at least when it comes to math, it's like way better. Um, I'm not sure when it comes to translations, I assume it's maybe a little bit better. When it comes to discussing grammar and translations, I'm not sure. But I think over time, yeah, it's just, it's just going to improve, which is exciting, but also scary. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of see, you know, I agree with everything that's been said so far. Um, I am, I'm very curious to see how the continued monetization of AI interacts with the economy in K through 12 in general. We know that there's a teacher shortage across the nation. And in the past, we have seen uh, school districts try to replace uh, teachers with things like Rosetta Stone. And so I feel like that is going to be one of those things that school districts might take a look at if we still don't, uh, if we still continue to deal with this teacher shortage in America, um, how do you maybe use these AI resources to run a classroom or do you? Um, and so those kind of questions sort of pop up for me is, you know, does it actually start replacing jobs? I personally think it won't per se, um, but I don't think that nobody's going to try it. Interesting. You know, I mean, just in closing, I, it, it seems to me that you know, every time there's an, a significant innovation, there's always this discussion that it's going to replace teachers and it's going to lighten everybody's workload and people will be superfluous and they'll be furloughed and, and so forth. And what ends up happening is that it doesn't. It creates more work, uh, creates more expectations and, and demand and so forth. It doesn't necessarily translate into solving the teacher shortage problem and uh, it, it you know can increase un, unremediated workloads, but um, unremunerated. But, um, you know, it, it certainly remains to be seen. Um, one thing I was you know, none, none of you seem to be frightened of, uh, you know, giving it the nuclear codes and it's going to replace all of us and it's gloom and doom. It's, you know, it's software, it's running somewhere on some server. Uh, these things will continue to evolve. Um, and we, at least, at least at this point, we're still in control of everything. But I do think there's a lot of questions about using it appropriately, detecting how students are using it, making sure that there isn't plagiarism, making sure that, as you mentioned, Jesse, the copyright is respected. Um, but I think it's uh, you know, a democratization, perhaps, you know, that hopefully it will not broaden the digital divide, but help to close it. That's one of the Jason mentioned that, I think, as well. So uh, fascinating topic. Thank you all so much uh, for those uh, watching us today. So just a reminder, you can find us on FLTMag.com, the IELTS interview project. This is episode 10. Uh, and uh, IELTS, um, FLT Mag is part of IELTS. And um, we look forward to uh, interacting with you. And um, you, you'll have the information for our guests today on the page that hosts this broadcast. So thank you all very much. And thanks we'll see for having you. us. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us.